There you have President Trump and the Japanese Prime Minister Shinzo Abe leaving their joint press conference after a meeting in the Oval Office there in the White House. I'm Amna Nawaz, live in New York. We're going to have a little bit of a breakdown of everything you heard there and some of the other big headlines happening today because, of course, there is a lot, as usual, happening in and around Washington. For more on that, I want to bring in a couple of my colleagues. ABC's political director Rick Klein is joining us live from Washington. Hey, Rick, how's it going? Hey, guys, how are you? Good, good. And also joining you, uh, joining us from Washington, ABC News contributor, retired Marine Colonel Stephen Ganyard. Thanks so much for being with us, Colonel. Pleasure. So guys, let's kick it off with the big headline today. We just saw President Trump leaving the press conference there. This was his first visit, uh, Prime Minister Shinzo Abe's first visit to the White House there since President Trump took office. And uh, Colonel, let me start off with you. You're familiar with a lot of how these things work because we see the press conference, but there's a lot of meetings and infrastructure and mechanisms going on behind the scenes. What do we learn from this three-day visit of Prime Minister Abe? Well, I think the I think the thing that's most important is that it's been a very calm visit up to this point. Um, you know, if you look at some of the uh, the previous missteps, the relationship with the Prime Minister of Australia, <clears throat> excuse me, um, there, it, it hasn't always gone smoothly uh, thus far in the, in the administration. But what we see here is a very measured uh, state visit, and uh, and the fact that we haven't seen any big surprises, and that we think that there's lots going on behind the scenes in terms of the military relationship, in terms of of, uh, of trade. Uh, and the uh, and the future of the relationship of the two countries, I think that uh, I think that this is this is all good uh, and and a change from what we've seen in the past couple of weeks. Hey, Rick, what do you make of how this meeting went? Because we know previous to this, as Mr. Trump is is uh, prone mm -hmm. to do, he's been tweeting about Japanese com companies, right? He kind of threatened Toyota, saying if they built a new plant in Mexico, there was going to be a tax. Um, and we know there's been some communication between the the two countries before. But h how did it go? How did he do today? It felt to me like, like Prime Minister Abe was going out of his way to shower praise on President Trump, calling him Donald, praising his business records, even at one point saying that he knows he's not nearly as good a golfer as the president. He knows how to, he knows how to get that ego stroked. And I, and I think you, you heard, I think, some concern voiced by the, by the prime minister about the Japanese-U.S. relationship. Obviously, the, the backing out of the TPP has been a very controversial move in Asia and beyond. But I think they realize, I think that the Japanese realize maybe more than most U.S. allies, the importance of developing this relationship. I think it's telling this already being the second meeting uh, and really the, the, one, of the, one of the first, well, the first, major meeting where they're going to go off-site and spend some time together in Florida uh, with, with their spouses. And you hear President Trump talking about that. So I think, I think Colonel Gagner is right. I mean, this is a president who is getting used to the job, frankly, and, and understanding with some growing pains what it's like to be on the world stage, here with a very friendly visitor in the Prime Minister of Japan, uh, kind of on his best behavior all around. Well, guys, both of you feel free to jump in here. I'll toss this out here because it feels like every time we have interaction with a foreign leader, we saw this with uh, British Prime Minister Theresa May as well, it feels like people are kind of try trying to figure out what this America first policy means for them. What do you make of that? I'll, I'll um, offer up one thought here. Um, you know, it, while, the, while the campaign was going on, uh, President Trump was very firm that we were going to pull out of uh, most of our multilateral trade agreements, uh, NAFTA, uh, TPP, you heard mentioned today. Uh, but it's interesting here because we're going to see what the true trade policy of the Trump administration is. And there are all sorts of rumors that they propose to the Japanese. You heard Prime Minister Abe uh, allude to the potential for a bilateral trade agreement. So if you think about the U.S. and Japan, they make up, the two countries make up about 30 percent of the global GDP. So you would get most of what you were going to get out of TPP, which is a huge multilateral agreement that's gotten watered down. And uh, if you do a bilateral, which President Trump may be more comfortable doing the negotiation himself, uh, you may get something that is almost uh, what you would have gotten with a TPP, uh, but, uh, but on, on the president's terms and, and something that he can claim credit for. I think this is probably what we're going to see in Canada as well when you see, uh, and Mexico, as you see NAFTA renegotiated to, to some degree. So this idea that, that uh, a President Trump would be isolationist or would, would manage the economy uh, in some way that would be uh, uh, retro, uh, I think uh, maybe uh, may be changing. We may be seeing what the true policy is going to be. And that said, Amna, I, I was struck by the way that he talks about America first. And it, it was almost as if when, when he starts going on about how America is going to be greater than ever, you expect him to say, and it's going to be good for Japan as well. I didn't hear that. <laughs> 
And, and I think those, uh, that, that to me was, was something that, that uh, I would think the prime minister and Japanese press, Japanese audience would be listening for, that this can be mutually beneficial. And I'm not doubting that he sees it that way, but I still think this is, at least as a public posture, uh, th this is this is the same one that we saw the same president we saw as a candidate talking about the need to make America great again. Well, guys, I'd love to get your take on this, too, because I remember after Prime Minister May's visit, the British press, uh, parts of it at least, hounded her for basically saying that she was, it looked as if she was going out of her way uh, to be polite and deferential towards President Trump. And, Rick, you mentioned that you had a sort of similar takeaway uh, in terms of first impressions from this press conference. Of course, we have no idea what's happening behind the scenes here. But so far, it looks as if that sort of combative, po that combative posturing um, on the front end by President Trump is at least making this dynamic happen. And there are some very real security threats that these guys have to deal with, right? The last question there from the Japanese correspondent was about the South China Sea and some of China's uh, aggressions in that area. So how does this play out in terms of national security and America's role moving forward? Uh, I'll, I'll say that uh, I think there are some very serious discussions being had uh, behind the scenes in terms of the military relationship. Uh, Japan, as a policy, spends less than 1 percent of its gross uh, domestic product on its defense budget, whereas the U.S. is up somewhere around 3.5, uh, 3.7 percent. So uh, they rely very much uh, not only on the U.S. nuclear umbrella, but they also rely uh, on the U.S. for uh, much of their conventional uh, defense. So uh, we know that before President Trump was even elected, some of his surrogates had traveled to Japan and made it very clear to the Japanese that the Japanese would be expected to contribute more to the defense, more to the f defense of not only the alliance, but also the South China, East China Sea, where China has become very belligerent uh, and has become a threat to, uh, to most of the uh, nations in the region. So uh, my guess is that we are going to have some, some, uh, some sort of an announcement about an increased uh, Japanese defense budget. Uh, the Japanese press has floated the number of 1.2 percent uh, of GDP, and that may be an opening number. So I think President Trump is going to get the Japanese to spend more on the mutual defense of both countries, uh, and that is not going to play well in Beijing. Hey, Rick, I got to get your take on another kind of big national security story. Um, as it relates to someone we saw walk into that press conference, that is uh, Mr. Trump's national security advisor, Mike Flynn, General Mike Flynn. There were a lot of headlines swirling over the past several weeks about possible contact between the Trump campaign before he took office and the Russian embassy. There's been some new information now. What can you tell us about that? Well, you know, Donald Trump was not asked about it. And I, I, I'm sure journalists had other questions, but he did not get any questions about this today. So the, the White House, the White House hasn't had a direct questions on the record to, to this yet. But the new information is that despite previous denials from General Flynn and from uh, surrogates at the White House, even the Vice President of the United States, indeed the issue of lifting sanctions was discussed, at least indirectly, between General Flynn. Uh, and the Russian ambassador to the United States during the transition period. That is a very serious shift in story and a very serious allegation with potential legal consequences, not to mention political consequences, because you have White House officials who appear to have been, based on their own accounts, misled by General Flynn. Flynn's own account has shifted now. He's saying he doesn't recall any conversation around this, but can't rule out that sanctions may have been discussed. This is serious, and you're hearing a chorus of predominantly Democrats now, but also foreign policy experts in both parties saying, look, it's an important principle in America to have one president at a time. And the idea that, that General Flynn or anyone representing the Trump administration, before it's an administration, would have this kind of discussions with the Russians, highly inappropriate. And it might actually explain some of the coziness that we've heard from Vla between Vladimir Putin and Donald Trump over the last couple of weeks, even in the, in the closing weeks. You remember, this was tense times. We had President Obama increasing sanctions and, and, and putting the screws to Russia over the, the apparent attempted hacking during the campaign. So this is serious stuff, and I think it's going to be to the White House and General Flynn to answer for it. Colonel Ganyard, in addition to your military career, you've served under the Department of State, the Department of Defense. I'm curious to get your take on how this story seems to be unfolding in terms of the relationship between this administration and the Russian leadership. Yeah, it, it's it's inexplicable. I mean, I think Rick was being charitable there to have some sort of quid pro quo offer um, from a from a uh, government that hasn't even been uh, inaugurated yet is is um, it, it looks very very bad and and so. Hard to, hard to say how this is going to turn out, what, what it's going to do to General Flynn's career. I think that he has the confidence and at least the trust of the president himself, and so I doubt that it will end up, uh, end up uh, having him lose his job. But 
These are the kinds of things that are just, it just doesn't go on, has never go, gone on, and it's why most people, especially in the foreign policy establishment, are, are frankly aghast at the way uh, diplomacy has been conducted up to this point. I think last night, though, we probably saw a turning point when, when we had the concession uh, to Xi Jinping uh, in the, in the, uh, in the conference, or, uh, call that was done where uh, President Trump said that he would honor this one China policy, which has been the foundation of U.S. policy for 40 years. Uh, or so, uh, and, and that seemed like a very measured response. I think the, the Abe visit today, we're seeing uh, perhaps the, the, the uh, policy-making apparatus of the whole government now that we have a Secretary of State, now that we have a Secretary of Defense, that we're finally beginning to allow those support mechanisms that a president needs to calmly and deliberately develop policy. Hopefully those are coming into play, and as Rick noted before, this may be the beginning of a, of a much more stable uh, uh, c uh, conduct of foreign policy by the U.S.